Thanks to everyone who's joining from whether you're joining us on Zoom, Facebook, or LinkedIn. We're just waiting for folks to join. We'll give it another minute or so and get started. All right, so we are good to go. Welcome everyone. We are here today uh, to talk about whether it now is the right time uh, for you to apply to graduate school. My name is Samin Mosin. I'm the Managing Director of Marketing and Product Management at HBS Online, and I'm here with Patrick Mullane, Executive Director of HBS Online. Before we get started, I'll do a quick intro background on Patrick, and then uh, we'll move forward with the, with the session. So, um, by way of introduction, Patrick brings over 20 years of management experience across a variety of different industries. Prior to joining HBS Online, Patrick held various leadership roles in manufacturing businesses and also served as a captain in a US Air Force intelligence organization. In terms of an educational background, Patrick has a BS in mathematics from the University of Notre Dame and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Prior to gaining his MBA, he also received an MS in project and systems management from Golden Gate University. So a couple of graduate degrees there um, for us to draw on from Patrick's experience um, related to today's topic. So in terms of process, I'm going to start with a few questions for Patrick this afternoon and then hopefully take questions from the audience um, and over the next uh, few minutes here, uh, hope to answer some of your questions as well. In terms of asking questions, you can submit questions via the Zoom Q&A or through our Facebook and LinkedIn channels, wherever you're joining us from today. So to get started, Patrick, um, let's talk a little bit about motivation. What do you think are some common motivations for going to graduate school? Uh, thanks, Samin. And by the way, I should mention for everybody listening that Samin has also gone to graduate school. She also got her MBA at Harvard. So uh, I may throw some questions back at you <laughs> to ask your opinion yeah. about some things as we go through this, make it a conversation. Um, so when it comes to motivations, uh, I'll start with a kind of a negative is unfortunately, I think a lot of people, particularly people coming right out of undergrad, often the motivation is I don't know what else to do. And mm -hmm. that's not a good motivation. Um, it's particularly risky um, if, you know, it, when you're young and even when you're older, um, I'm a good example of that. Uh, often you don't know for sure what the path forward is. And I'm not suggesting everybody have a, you know, 50 point written plan with everything that's gonna happen in their lives, but you should, you know, at least have some directional ideas about what you wanna do uh, with your life. And if you don't, and you're just going to get a degree because your friends are, because you don't have a job or you don't know what else to do, I, I would say that's pretty dangerous. I would not recommend that. Um, as far as uh, other motivations, I think they fall in a few categories. Some are very career specific. If you're gonna to go to law school, you probably wanna be a lawyer. Uh, there are certainly variations on law that you, uh, you could do. Um, and having thought through um, what you might wanna do in law, I think is important. I will mention with respect to law specifically, uh, some things I've read is a lot of people who've gone to law school and become lawyers, they tend to show more dissatisfaction later in life with their jobs than people who went other career fields. I think part of that's because a lot of what you study in law school isn't necessarily what you're going to do. So, you know, studying constitutional law is very exciting, but very few people are going to argue before the Supreme Court one day. So it's really important to make sure that you have uh, realistic expectations about what you do, because that can lead to disappointment. But um, having a strategy with respect to what you want to do with your career and the flexibility you want to have can have a lot of uh, import when it comes to what you select. So MBAs tend to be pretty versatile. You can do a lot of different things with them. Law is a little more narrow. Medicine in some ways is even more narrow, although arguably you could do different things there. So having motivation for a career field is clearly, uh, is clearly one of them. Um, so I would just encourage people that um, whatever your motivation, make sure it's deliberate and it's not, I just don't have anything else to do. Yeah, that's a great point, right? You don't want to fall into graduate school by default, um, given some of the topics we're going to talk about later on regarding costs and so yeah. forth. Um, what do you think are some important considerations before applying to a graduate program? 
And sort of a follow on question to that is, does it differ based on what the job market looks like? I mean, you know, we're, we're in pretty unusual situations. So are there different considerations for when it's a strong job market versus a weaker job market? Yeah, my opinion is that uh, you shouldn't you shouldn't have your plans radically change just because of what the economy is doing, because it's very difficult to predict what the economy mm -hmm. is going to do. And you certainly don't want to do something, as I alluded to earlier, just because the economy, for example, is weak. Um, but I do think that the logic you should use when evaluating what you're going to do with respect to graduate school um, is important, more important maybe when the economy is tough, but still important when it's fine. And what I mean by that, and you alluded to it earlier, is really doing a true cost benefit analysis. Um, for a lot of people, this feels very MBA-ish and you know, we're a business school here, but um, I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of really thinking through what it's going to cost you in time uh, versus and expense in foregone income if you're deciding to go full time and how much of that you can pay for yourself versus borrow for and making sure that you've done the math that you know that the, the skills you're going to gain are going to allow you to earn an income to pay back any debt you might incur. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you've got the money, go crazy, do whatever, you know, whatever floats your boat. Um, but it's never a comfortable place to be to get out of school with a lot of debt that's difficult to pay back because you didn't anticipate it. Uh, and let me uh, give an example too of, of a real example of something that I've seen people make mistakes in. Um, there are some jobs that will require a master's degree. A good example of that is a lot of states require teachers to have master's degrees. Mm -hmm. But in almost every state, to be really blunt about it, it's just a box checking exercise. They don't care where you got that degree. So spending a ton of money for some highfalutin institution um, just because you want that brand and going into debt for it, when you're then going to go teach, which unfortunately in most countries and certainly in the United States doesn't pay nearly as well as other jobs do, you might be setting yourself up for some financial difficulty. So I, you know, I think that through. There are other cases where it may make sense to pay for a brand. An, an example I often give is that if you, you know, when I was a student at HBS, if you wanted to work for Goldman Sachs and you went to uh, a university where they didn't recruit, well, guess what? You're not going to, at least initially, you're not probably not going to get a job there. It doesn't mean it's impossible, but it doesn't right. make it more difficult. So thinking through uh, those sorts of things are really uh, powerful. And um, nobody likes to think about, you know, I think we have this thing about pursuing your dream and edu education is never wasted, all things that are good and true, but it can make your life pretty tough if you then uh, you're worried about how you're going to pay your rent because you've got such a debt load and you can't earn that, uh, earn enough income to pay that. Yeah. I mean, sticking on that point around cost, are there other considerations um, and how should costs really factor into the decision-making process? Yeah. I mean, I alluded to it earlier. It, it's, um, there's a lot of talk right now, particularly in the age of COVID, is a degree worth it? Um, and that's not a fair question because it just it is, as with most things in life, it depends, right? Um, I think paying a lot of money for a degree that gets you an unbelievable network um, and a great education uh, and the earning power to get it back is certainly can be a, a great trade-off, but not everybody can or should go to Harvard, for example. I love the place, but um, there's plenty of other schools mm -hmm. in the world that do a uh, wonderful job of teaching. You know, accounting's accounting, no matter where you, where you study it. Um, so, uh, you know, I often use this as an example um, that often, you know, I grew up in Texas and in some parts of Texas, if you say you went to Harvard, people won't give you a job. Uh, so if you I know can have the reverse effect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if you know you're going to uh, live in the uh, San Antonio area the rest of your life, going to the University of Texas for your master's degree may make a lot more sense because it's got a much bigger network. I guarantee you there's a lot more University of Texas graduates running around San Antonio than there are Harvard Business School graduates. So, uh, you know, considering those sorts of factors matter because I will say networks, no matter your job, Mm -hmm. uh, your career field, I think matter much more importantly than people realize, particularly again, when you're younger, um, I, I look back in a rearview mirror now and see how important those networks are. Every job I've had since I worked at Harvard Business School, I had the connection to getting that job because of somebody I knew at Harvard Business School. So, um, and I think that's true for a lot of my classmates as well. And I think that's true at a lot of institutions, whether it's Harvard or any other place in the, in the country. Yeah, that's certainly been my experience as well. Um, really, as I think about the last, at least, maybe not the first job coming out of um, business school, but since then everyone has been networked in some way and comes back to, yeah. to the broad network from 
from the educational institution. Yeah. So, and even my first job it was because I joined a startup founded by two classmates mm -hmm. of mine. So even that, you know, came out of the people came I met in my, uh, yeah. in my school. Great. So shifting gears a little bit, um, you know, why did you personally feel like the MBA was was right for you, and what made you decide to pursue an MBA? Well, uh, you mentioned I was in the military, so I went ROTC through college. I came out of uh, undergraduate, went and worked in the military for five years, um, and then decided I wanted to leave. I actually loved what I did, but uh, the nature of the military is you never keep doing the same thing, right? You're going to bounce around to something else. And I always thought I might want to be involved in business. So I came out of the military, and I actually joined a, uh, an auto parts manufacturing distribution company and lived in the center of the U.S., uh, and did that for two years. And during that time, I started thinking about going to graduate school. And I, I had narrowed it down to either law school or getting an MBA. I knew I wanted to be involved in business and obviously in law school, uh, or to get a law degree, you can be involved in business quite a bit as well. And um, ultimately what swayed me was uh, some statistics I mentioned earlier, um, or at least referenced earlier, as I had read a number of articles that just said that a lot of law school students weren't nearly as satisfied many years out as were MBA uh, students. Mm -hmm. So that had, a, that had a great deal to do with swaying me. It also, it also fit a little more with what I wanted to, wanted to do. Um, by the way, I think one reason um, that lack of satisfaction is there too, I should mention, is there's one big difference between most MBA programs, certainly the more competitive MBA programs and law schools is that most competitive MBA programs require you to have work experience. Mm. Uh, most law schools do that not. Is, right. Right. And so I, I think part of it's just a matter of you haven't lived much, right? You went straight from undergrad and then straight to law school. I do think that if law schools, this is Patrick Mullane opinion, uh, but I don't have any data to support this, but I think if law school said, hey, mm -hmm. you need two years as well, you probably see fewer people go to law school because they they go off and discover there are other things that, that might interest them. And then when they went to law school, I think there'd be more satisfaction because mm -hmm. they probably have more confidence that it's the right thing for them. And I say all that to say that I don't think people should be shy about taking, you know, we talk about gap years after high school to college. Mm -hmm. There's something to be said for gap years after undergrad and before going to grad school, because I think it does refine your view of the world a little better, makes you more confident in what you're gonna to like to do. Not in all cases, but I do think it's probably better than not uh, to do that if, if it's possible. Mm -hmm. and, and how did the, the masters in um, project and systems management fit into that decision-making and process for you as well? Yeah, uh, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. It's a great point. You know, th that falls more in the category of what I was talking about earlier when I was talking about teachers and having a box checked. Mm. Um, I wasn't sure when I started that degree if I was going to stay in the Air Force, but as an officer in the Air Force to be promoted, you have to have a master's degree. Got it. But again, generally, it doesn't really matter where you got it. So mm -hmm. I just picked a school that was nearby. I was living in the San Francisco Bay Area. Golden Gate University is a school there in the Bay Area. Um, and this was, I was commenting before we started the webinar, this was before online, mm -hmm. that old. So I was actually commuting at night after I'd get off my day job and go to a uh, classroom location and take two classes a night, you know, three nights a week. Um, so in that case, I was, I was using that logic I say a lot of teachers should use, which is I, I just really needed a degree. So I found a thing that was convenient, good cost, good program, um, and, it, and in a field that I needed because I was going to be doing a lot of project management if I stayed in the Air Force. And frankly, you know, if you do any job, you're going to do a lot of project right. management. I felt it was kind of flexible. So that's, yeah. that's how I decided. Let me so uh, so ask I said I was going to turn a question back on you. Why did you decide to get an MBA? Uh, so for me, I, um, you know, I, I studied geological and environmental sciences as an undergrad and uh, came out and joined management consulting because I thought that would be interesting overall. But what's interesting about management consulting is it gives you great exposure to a variety of industries, but generally it's pretty narrow exposure to the specific problem that your client is facing. So as I, you know, move further into my career, kind of a year into being a management consultant, you know, I thought to myself, well, you know, I'm getting very good at, let's say, sourcing cardboard for, um, a, you know, FMCG company or, um, you know, learning the products that go into steel manufacturing for a steel um, a client, but it doesn't, I don't have that kind of grounding and overall view of business. And so as I thought about, you know, going forward in my career, I realized that that was a gap that needed to be filled. So for me, it was really looking to fill 
um, that gap in knowledge and and really a way to accelerate the experience as well. So given that I had heard a lot about the HBS MBA program and you know learning through the case methodology and being able to experience many different views, that component of that of the learning really appealed to me. And you know, fast forward, I. I after my MBA, I did go back to the same consulting organization uh, that I had been at before, prior to that. Um, and it was a very different perspective that I had on the problems that, the, that my clients were facing. All of a sudden, I was able to kind of zoom out and think about the, the problem that we were solving, not only in the context of the specific problem, but step back and say, what's, what's really the problem here with the client? And I don't think I would have had that ability to step back and look at the broader business problem without those couple of years of just doing the reps of different cases and thinking about things from different ways. So I think, you know, in the immediate term, it helped me, but over the long term, definitely, you know, it was exactly the type of experience and, and education I was looking for to take my career in different ways. So. Yeah, by the way, you, you mentioned that makes me think of something that I think is important to note too, is that for when people are considering what they want to do and getting that broader perspective, certainly in the area of business, because, you know, we make, um, you know, non-degree business courses, so they're not master's degrees, but they do give you a good sense of that broader perspective, particularly with the case mm -hmm. method. Um, so one thing related to a question you asked earlier that I would encourage people to do is if you're not sure, if you're a little wiggly about what you want to do, um, taking online courses to get more solidified, um, I think is really a great approach. And again, it's not one that was available to me, but that I would have jumped all over. And not only that is that it's, it clearly isn't wasted. So for example, if you're considering an MBA program and you end up taking one of our, um, online courses, uh, and there's many out there, it doesn't have to be with us, but I'm just using us as an example. Mm -hmm. Um, it's going to help on your application because you'll, you can say, Hey, I took this course. Uh, you know, it shows you're interested. It shows you're motivated to learn of your own accord. It shows you're interested in the topic area and it gives you hopefully a broader view like you're talking about before you even right. enter the program to know that it's going to be right for you. So it's something that I think uh, people should think about utilizing. Yeah, no, definitely a bit of, bit of experience to draw upon, yeah. right? Even though it's not technically exactly working in that field, you, ha you have some context yeah. for it. Um, so we've talked a lot about why people should go to graduate school or, or think about that, you know, what are some reasons to not go to graduate school? Well, I highlighted, highlighted my biggest one is don't do it um, because you don't, you can't think of anything else to do. Um, the other reason is to not do it if it's going to, if the math on the financials don't work out. Um, again, this is a, like a, it's almost like a religion topic to a lot of people. It mm -hmm. feels like you're quashing somebody's dream, but I know a lot of people and have read anecdotal stories of people I don't know personally who have mm -hmm. really been buried under debt um, and it's made their lives pretty miserable, uh, even though they thought they were pursuing um, their dream at the time. The other thing I wouldn't do, and it gets back to one of the topics here, you know, we're talking about in kind of tougher economic times, which we're cer certainly in now. I, uh, I mentioned earlier, I don't think you should change your plans based on the economy. And the mm -hmm. reason I say that is if you know what the economy is going to do, then contact me because I'll start placing bets in the stock market if you know what the future holds. <laughs> we don't need graduate degrees. You can make a lot of money just doing that. Uh, so nobody knows. Um, so, you know, I, that's not to say that, it, it, that during a downturn, it could be a good time. If you've always said you want to get an MBA and you got furloughed and you have this opportunity to do it and that math works out with respect to, mm -hmm. to how you're going to pay for it, then by all means, I think now, now is a good time. Um, the other thing I, I will say there is data on, um, but again, I say this with some hesitancy because I don't want people to try and time things, is if you graduate during a recession, um, your earnings will be depressed literally the rest of your life because you're mm -hmm. going you're, you're to get a job with possibly lower pay. And then every job you have after that, your expectation will be, oh, it'll be so much percentage over that as I kind of move up in, in the ranks. Um, I bring it up to say that don't, if you do graduate in recession, make sure you don't sell yourself short for the rest of your career because your first job happened to be lower paying than it otherwise would have been if you had graduated during a hot market. So something else to think about. Yeah, and definitely gaining an MBA or another graduate program could be a great way of level setting that, right? So yeah. you come out of an undergrad during a recession and you feel like, okay, it's a good opportunity for me to, to step up. In a That's a great point. That's a great yeah. point. And that's, I, and that's another thing I forgot to mention about uh, a good reason to get an MBA in particular 
um, is if you're really trying to pivot your career. Um, it does provide an inflection point that particularly if you go to an in-residence two-year program um, where you're kind of just, you stop a job, you meet a whole new network and then recruiters come to campus, you have an opportunity to do something else. If you want to pivot your career, that's a great opportunity to do it. Um, if you don't want to pivot your career and you want to stay in your job, that's a great opportunity for an online degree uh, because you can hopefully continue working in your job, get your MBA right. or whatever the advanced degree is while you're still working um, and then use that new knowledge to get a boost in your career at the place where you already are. Oh, that's yeah, definitely a great point there in terms of the difference between, you know, the in-person versus the online. Um, a lot of our audience here today is familiar with our uh, offerings, but can you talk a little bit about the difference between uh, the courses that we offer that HBS Online offers and the HBS MBA program or other MBA programs? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, obviously there's all sorts of flavors now of MBA programs from, you know, hybrid online to in-person, probably a little less in-person now until COVID's gone, but at least in a normal state. Um, yeah, I mentioned earlier, our programs and a lot of schools do this. We have a lot of uh, ours, we have exclusively our online programs or non-degree programs. So they're meant to be either programs are going to help you prepare for an advanced degree in business, or they're just supplemental to an education you already have that give you uh, uh, skills and tools to learn in your job without having to leave that job. So again, it's great for people either considering going for an advanced degree who just want to test the waters and or um, you know, give a boost to their resume by showing that they've taken courses in business and done well in them. Um, or it's, it's just a great opportunity if it's online to stay in your career, as I said, and advance it without having to leave. Um, the, on, the, uh, at, Harvard, at Harvard, the only way to get an MBA is to come in residence for uh, two years, as, as you know, as well. And um, it's an incredible experience. And there's, and again, there's lots of schools that have really incredible experiences beyond Harvard. Um, but I would say that in most cases, um, that's, it's obviously a big financial commitment. It's a big time commitment. So I think having some sense of what you want to do is pretty important. By the way, it's pretty important in the application process. And you sit in the admissions committee, right? If, if you just yeah. show up and say, well, I'm not sure why I want to be here, you're not going to get into a competitive program. If you show up and say, I really know what I want to do, and this is why this program fits for me, uh, that resonates a lot more with people who do admissions, I think. Yeah, and I would say that that's true of any graduate program you know, yep. across the board. Um, so shifting uh, to some questions from our audience now, um, how would you prioritize a business school application in terms of location, network versus curriculum? Um, so, yeah, it's funny you say that. So I, I can't remember what faculty member has done this, but there's a faculty member at HBS who did research on this. And... Um, his findings were contradictory to unconventional wisdom. There, there used to be the sense that go for the job you love. Don't worry about where you're going to live and you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. And his research showed the opposite. Um, and it was, um, and again, I think this is hard this school professor. It's been so long, but it was basically that, no, pick a place you really love to be and your happiness will be greater. Even if your job satisfaction might be slightly less than it would have been if you're in another location. And I can say that um, the older I've gotten, the more convinced I've become by that. Because if you don't like where you live, it's hard to make everything it's, else work. <laughs> so yeah, uh, so yeah I, I, uh, I think I would prioritize, I mean, if you're, it, if you're thinking about where, um, and I, it wasn't clear to me if they're talking about after the MBA or during the MBA, if you're talking but, about- here, yeah, right. yeah, no, I think it's, a, it's it sounds like it's, um, which it sounds like a question around which business school should you focus of on one that's based on the network or location versus curriculum. Okay. So for example, finance focus, should you go for an MBA program that has a finance focus or think about other factors? Yeah. So, uh, so first of all, networks and location, if it's a, if it's a school, um, there's not very many of them, by the way, almost all schools are regional in nature, even really big brands mm -hmm. are regional in nature. Um, you know, if, if you're going to though, as I said before, be staying in the Silicon Valley, then going and getting a master's degree somewhere in the Silicon Valley is probably a good idea if you want to have that network. So I think thinking about where you're going to work, getting back to the, the question I was answering that apparently wasn't asked, getting back to where you're going to live afterwards. But it's I similar. Would, yeah. Yeah. I, I would think through that. Uh, again, it doesn't mean, I don't want to make it sound like if you live in the Bay Area, you go to various uh, school because you think you're going to stay there. And then all of a sudden you're moving 
to Dallas that you'll never find a job. Of course not. That's not the case. I'm just saying that you know, there's some built-in networks that will give you a distinct advantage right away. I yeah, don't I, think, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just going to add to that to say, you know, it, lo- it depends a little bit of what you're looking for, right? So if you're looking for a job in finance and you know that let's say you pick a firm and everyone at that firm has gone to a certain school or has a certain background that may give you a clue as to what's more important to them. But then you have to evaluate in terms of what you were yeah. saying earlier, Patrick, if that's what's important to you, right? So it's that balance. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. I think, I think the strategy of knowing where, you know, the field you want to work in and seeing if the school funnels a lot of people to that field is mm-hmm. probably the way to think about it. And, that, and it doesn't really matter where that is now. It's also highly likely that schools that are into uh, or have um, kind of focus areas that they're very well known for, they're probably going to have an ecosystem around them in those focus areas. So, for example, you know, if you're in finance, being on the East Coast somewhere in and around New York City, yeah, there's probably, you know, some pretty strong networks there. Does that mean that you can't go to a university in Illinois and not work on Wall Street? Of course not. But again, it probably just makes it a little tougher because networks really matter when getting hired. So I agree with you. I think you're absolutely right about that. Yep. Another question. Um, do you think a pure and uh, do you think pure online MBA degrees are competitive with residency ones or in-person ones? Um, again, it all depends. I mean, um, I always say to people, think of it this way, are all in-residence programs comparable to each other? Well, of course not, right? There's, mm-hmm. they, they all have different things that are good about them, things that detract from them. Uh, some are competitive, some are not. I think it's the same with online. Now, online necessarily probably started as kind of less competitive, kind of a fringe thing, certainly 15 mm-hmm. years ago. But I think that's changed substantially. I don't think there are a lot of people um, in the next, you know, 15 to 20 years, no, less than that, five to 15 to 20 years, I, I think you're going to see a lot less um, bias uh, to the extent it existed before against online, uh, online programs. Uh, and to the specific question, though, again, go, going to where I started, that there are some that are, you know, good and uh, known to be competitive and have great brands associated with them. Um, that, uh, you know, are going to be viewed by hiring managers, I think, just as favorably as, as some of the in-resident stuff. And the other thing people forget is that the more people that do it are then going to become the hiring managers. Right. So, so it's, it's network guaranteed. Effect. Yeah, exactly. It becomes a virtuous cycle. So mm-hmm. I guarantee you, I, I can say with almost complete, well, not almost, I can say with certainty, mm-hmm. 20 years from now, you'll see a lot more people getting hired with online degrees because a hiring manager will have had an online degree. Yeah. And my perspective is the pandemic really has has accelerated a lot of this um, acceptance of online as as um, as a medium for education. I think we were already kind of on our way there. But, yep. um, you know, if I were to think about the last six months or so, I think even more kind of the stamp of approval, if you will. I think that's true, too. Um, question from the Facebook audience. What is the Harvard educational difference in a nutshell? And so maybe I'll modify that question to say what's the Harvard Business School educational difference yeah. because Harvard is such a broad entity. Yeah, a lot of people know Harvard has 11 schools that operate virtually independently. So they, they all do their own thing. Um, so I'm glad you narrowed the question because I couldn't answer the other one. Um, <laughs> but Harvard Business School, I mean, uh, you, you mentioned it earlier, our signature uh, aspect, if you will, is the case method of study, which if you haven't experienced it, it's hard to describe. It's but it's, it's really an impactful way of learning because it forces you to kind of learn through storytelling by putting yourself in the shoes of managers who are facing an issue and then working through it with a cohort uh, and with a faculty member uh, through the Socratic method. It's a conversation and it sounds kind of hokey. It's hard, to, like I said, it's hard to, uh, to visualize, um, but it really works and is a really impactful um, way to learn. So I think I think that's uh, probably our biggest differentiator. The, the other thing is just the physical campus. I mean, for those who haven't been to Harvard Business School, the campus is uh, is its own university in its own right. Um, mm-hmm. I think we have 50 acres and 35 buildings. You know, it's it's pretty impressive, and that's unusual for a grad for just a single graduate school mm-hmm. to have the physical plant that Harvard Business School uh, does. And then lastly. Uh, we've talked about a lot is the network is pretty amazing. Um, there's not um, a, a field in the world, anywhere in the world where you can't, you know, go to the alumni database and find somebody to call to help you answer a question or get you connected to somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, and as I said, 
all universities have networks of some kind. Some are strong, some are weak. It may matter to you, it may not, but I certainly think it's something, one of the biggest things that people don't consider that should be considered when getting any graduate degree because those networks really matter. Oh, great. With that, I think we're at time. So any final words, Patrick, that you wanna share with the audience? No, I, I, uh, I hope everybody um, is doing well during this uh, tough time. As I said, I think there's good times uh, there's no bad time to go to graduate school. There are bad decisions with respect to choosing graduate school and paying for it. Uh, so just make sure you give those things uh, some thought and read all you can about how other people have made decisions. You know, that really helps inform, uh, inform you, I think, and makes the chances that you make the right call uh, that much higher. Yeah, definitely. So I wanna thank you, Patrick, um, for sharing um, some you. time with us. And um, yeah, and thank you to the audience for participating across all the platforms wherever you joined us today. Um, you know, there were some great questions out there that we didn't get a chance to answer. So I would say, you know, tap into the HBS online community and audience, ask those questions and continue to, to do that digging. So with that, um, hope uh, everyone has a wonderful rest of their day and week, and we'll end it there. Thank you. Thanks, Amin. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Patrick.